The Ancient Kingdoms of Peru by Nigel Davies Chapter 7 The Sacred City The Lion in the Mountain Garcilaso de la Vega, describing Cusco, writes, The Incas held the whole city as itself a sacred thing. It was one of the principal idols. Cusco was thus, in a sense, itself a huaca, endowed with a unique sanctity, representing for the Incas a concept as well as a city. It was often conceived as a mountain lion lying on its right side, with the great fortress of Saxahuaman as its head, the real Tulumayo as its back, while its tail emerges where the rivers Tulumayo and Watani coverage. According to the chronicler Juan de Petanzos, the southwestern part of the city was known as Bumap Juban, meaning the lion's tail. As part of its symbolic aura, Cusco was, in a more literal sense, the heart of their realm, since from its center radiated the, f the four arterial roads that led to the four suyus, or quarters, of the empire, collectively known in Quechua as Tawantin Suyu. The Cusco of the Imperial Era, as seen by the Spanish invaders, was essentially created by Pachacutec, though its successors further enhanced its splendor. No maps or plans of pre-Hispanic Cusco survive, but a few of the first Spaniards to view the city recorded their impressions. They described a city that was both refined and resplendent, yet returning a certain pristine touch. The temples were lavishly adorned with gold, but were, but were covered by roofs of straw. As an example, one may cite the great palace of Casana, where the conquistador Francisco Pizarro first lodged, and which had two towers of finely cut stone surmounted by straw roofs. Slaves exist in Peru, but the Incas continue to use thatch on a wooden frame. The central part of Cusco, with its narrow winding streets, possessed a certain somber grandeur, but lacked the great monumental vistas devised to enhance the splendor of other imperial cities. Nonetheless, as a modern visitor, one cannot help feeling that in its narrow streets and tiny alleys, one is brought closer to the true past, and even to a sense of how ancient Cusco might really have looked. Then might be the case in viewing the vestiges of imperial capitals of the old world, or even Tenochtitlan, where the Spanish metropolis was built on the ruins of the Aztec city. As an example, one may cite one early visitor, Sancho de la Hoz, who, though impressed by the architecture of the great stone houses, remarks on the narrowness of these streets. He describes them as, as a crossing at right angles, very straight, all paved with stone, and in the middle of each one runs a water channel lined with stone. Their defect is in being narrow, since only a single horseman can go on, w on one side of the channel and another on the other side. In spite of the comments of de la Hoz, the Spaniards themselves, accustomed to cramped cities of medieval structure, which even retain certain Muslim traits, sought to make a few changes in the original plan, except to reduce the great open space formed by the two principal squares of Alcaipata and Cusipata. Apart from the division into, into four suyus, formed by the, f the four great converging roads, the city was curiously endowed with a system of notional lands called Sasekis, that emanated like the spokes of a wheel from a central point, the great temple enclosure of Coricancha. The Seca system conformed to an ancient Andean tendency to express concepts in linear terms, present in Nazca and present also among many Andean groups, including the Aymara peoples of the Lake Titicaca region. In all, there were, four, there were 41 Secas, or notional lines in Cusco, mainly radiating from the Temple of the Sun. Dr. Tom Zuidema is the author of important studies which stress the extreme complexity of this system. On the 41 Secas, were situated no fewer than 328 huacas, or sacred stones, together with numerous sanctuaries. The Sikhs were not only important to Inca religion, but also basic to the calendrical system. A puzzling aspect is their relation to the Panacas, the households of defunct rulers, on an ostensibly arbitrary basis since Pachacutex's Panaca was generously endowed, while his successor, Tupac, was, ad was identified with a single Seke. The Two Cuscos Fundamental to both the layout and to the general concept of Cusco was the existence within the city of two moieties, Han Hanan Upper and Harin Lower Cusco, the latter being situated in the southeastern part, in the area where Tulumayu and Huatani rivers converge. As we have already seen, Manco and his immediate successors reportedly resided in the temple enclosure of Coricancha, situated in Hurin, and the division into two halves is attributed to Inca Roca, the sixth ruler. Thenceforth, the monarchs lived in Hanan, where each erected his own palace. These were built on a grandiose scale, complete with reception halls that could hold up to 3,000 people. 
They were provided with elaborate plumbing, and each palace had its own bathing establishment with hot and cold water which flowed along stone channels. Such a division into Harin and Hanan, far from being an innovation, was most widespread and existed in many regions as distant one from another as the Lupaca principalities of Lake Titicaca and the highlands of central Ecuador. While certain scholars suggest that the Incas might have imposed the system on parts of their vast realm where it had not existed before, the Hurin Hanan division, like so many other aspects of their rule, would seem to have dated from pre Inca times. The division of Cusco into two halves lies at the very root of its system of government, since from the time of Inca Roca onwards, Hunan Cusco assumed a certain primacy in war and secular government, whereas Urin, where Coricancha and countless other temples and, sh and shrines were, situ were situated, was the seat of religious hierarchy. The division into Urin and Anan has led certain authors to pose the question as to whether the two Cuscos, upper and lower, might have been ruled not by one but by two dynasties, as occurred, for instance, among the Lupaca, who at the time of the Vista of Garci Diaz de San Miguel in 1567 were still divided into two halves. Hanasaya and Hurinsaya, governed respectively by rulers named Kari and Kusi. In Cusco, notwithstanding any political primacy of Hanan, the traditional hierarchy of Hurin Cusco clearly retained much influence exercised, for instance, in their support of Huascar in the civil war against Atahualpa, just before the conquest. Fundamental to Pachacutex's rebuilding of Cusco was an ambitious program of public works, based on the canalization of the two rivers, whose flooding in the rainy season was a constant menace, and frequently inundated the city. The chronicler Juan de Patanzos describes the elaborate infrastructure. Having studied the program in detail, Pachacutec convoked the local lords, ordering, the, ordering them to gather in Cusco, bringing copious provisions and ample manpower. The work involved a process of canalization leading as far as Mojina, four leagues below the confluence of the two rivers. Large quantities of coarse stone were required to complete the, t the task. True to local tradition, these labors were preceded by five days of ritual feasting. After the whole work was completed, further festivities followed, lasting six days and involving the consumption of lavish quantities of chicha and coca, accompanied by a presentation of gifts. As we have already seen, Bachachacuchac revamped the great temple enclosure of Coricancha, which had also served as the residence of the early Inca rulers, whose cult was an, was an essential feature of the shrine. A portion of Coricancha survives today in the form of the curving wall be beneath the western end of the Church of Santo Domingo. The first Spaniards to arrive in Cusco found the buildings of the temple still, still sheathed in gold. They themselves were forced to strip the gold with copper crowbars since no Indian was willing to assist. In all, 700 plates from Coricancha were included in the gold sent to the north. The plates averaged 2 kilos in weight. The walls of Coricancha were constructed of coarse masonry, in which rectangular blocks are laid in even horizontal courses. A further example of this elaborate process, still visible today, is the site of the Aklahuasi, the home of the In Inca's chosen woman, and now the convent of Santa Catalina. Every visitor to Cusco is shown the stone of Hatun Rumiok. This was part of a construction built by the polygonal method, a form of tightly fitting masonry used by the Incas for their principal buildings. The famous stone has no fewer than 12 corners on its outer face. In its elaborate Inca polygonal masonry for the stones simply interlock with the convex part of one stone fitting exactly into the concave form of the other. Such stone cutting skills recalled those of earlier times in the region of Lake Titicaca and in particular the great ruins of Tiwanaku. Though its completion was the work of successive sovereigns, Pachacu Texas' establishment on the great fortress of Saxawaman also involved major feats of organization. Siesa de Leon writes that the basic task required a labor force of 20,000 men. These laborers worked only for a limited period, after which they were relieved by others. 4,000 men broke these stones, while 6,000 bore them to the side, and others dug the deep foundations. The workers were housed in nearby buildings, whose walls were still visible in Siesa's time. He comments on the vast size and weight of the blocks of stone, many of which can be seen today. He further confirms that Tupac Inca, Juana Capac, and even Huascar continue the work. A modern visitor may share the amazement of the first Spanish visitors that stones of such a size could have apparently been conveyed to Cusco from a distant quarry and then assembled into a complex jigsaw, still partly visible. Modern geologists, incidentally, disagree with Garcilasco and Ciesa and suggest that most of the material for Saxawaman was quarried a hundred meters north of the hill itself. 
the edifice was built to serve as a storehouse as much as a fort, and the Spaniards were astonished by the massive quantities of fine jewels, gold and silver, which they found there. It was also important as a shrine, serving as a temple to the sun that almost rivaled Coricancha. Basic to the general layout of the city was the great open space created by the two contiguous plazas, Alcapaita and Cusipata. Today, Cusipata has been built over while Alcapaita became the Plaza de Armas and survives as the main square. Or originally, Alcapata was reserved for the principal religious festivals, whereas Cusipata was the scene of military ceremonies and parades. Many palaces of the Hanan-based rulers were built on Alcapaita. On the north side was Cuyus Manco, sitting where the cathedral now stands. In this building, the Spaniards took refuge during the, re during the rebellion of Manco Inca. On the northwest side of the square were two great structures, Casana and Coracura. Casana was the largest palace, reportedly built by Pachacutec. Its outstanding feature was a huge hall of wooden columns. Garcilasco de la Vega saw it when he was a boy. In many of the houses of the Incas, there were the vast halls that were still intact in Cusco during my childhood. He was born in 1539. The largest Casana, which was capable of holding 4,000 people. The Great Hall of Casana was, was, was later destroyed to make way for colonial arcades and shops. On the opposite side of the square lay Juana Capax's palace, Amadu Cancha, with a great ga gateway of multicolored marble. Sancho de la Hoz describes it as the most impressive of the palaces on the square. The Jesuits' fine pink Baroque church of La Compañía now occupies the site. In describing the buildings of central Cusco, the heart of this, the city, it is important to bear in mind that only the nobility and their servants, the Llanas, together with members of the, reli the religious hierarchy, were privileged to live within its confines. Various chroniclers confirm that the Incas, by privilege, as opposed to the Orejones, or original nobles, were not allowed to reside inside central Cusco. They lived beyond the triangle bounded by the two rivers. Their dwellings, less elaborate than those of inner Cusco, were separated from the, from the latter by a stretch of open land. In contrast to the stone mansions and the old no, no, nobility, Siesta states that such houses were made of straw and wood, and l little trace of them survives. He makes the perhaps surprising comment that most of the city was inhabited by Mitimes, those countless settlers imported from conquered provinces. After many of the original inhabitants of, the, of this outer Cusco had been transferred to remoter regions as a means of establishing firm Inca control o over newly conquered peoples. Outer Cusco was thus an extensive area of dwellings, housing both the Incas by privilege and countless artisans and technicians. Estimates vary widely as to the total population. While the center of the city, the home of the elite, was clearly not large, by some accounts containing about 10,000 houses, the conquistador Sancho de la Hoz calculated that the whole valley of Cusco contained 100,000 houses, but such a figure may have included many dwellings that lay beyond, well beyond the confines of even the outer city. The Gods of Cusco Viracocha, as we have already seen, was the traditional creator deity. Closely associated with the shores of Lake Titicaca, he rose from the lake when all was dark and created, or recreated, the sun and moon. He then killed the previous inhabitants and fashioned new people out of stone, among them were, who were the fledging Incas, whom he led to the valley of Cusco. Viracocha is indisputably classed by the chroniclers in the role of the creator of all things, but they offer rather enigmatic, enigmatic pre interpretations of the degree to which this creator god retained the rank of supreme deity on whether, alternatively, he relinquished control of the world that he had fashioned to the, to the sky gods, among whom the primordial deity was Inti, the sun, worshipped as the divine ancestor of the Inca dynasty. A clear understanding of Inca religion is hard to attain since we depend on the writings of 16th century priests and conquistadors. Obsessed with the salvation of the pagan world through Christianity, a notion wholly meaningless to their native informants, they were thus ill disposed to probe the subtleties of Inca religious thought. These chroniclers tended to reinterpret and westernize concepts gleaned from their informants and which were wholly alien to them. As a result, a tendency to pigeonhole Andean deities and to regard each god or goddess as associated with certain specific functions linked to well-defined facets of human life. John Rowe is foremost among the scholars who first sought to interpret the chroniclers' accounts. He goes so far as to suggest that the Inca creation myth was a late compilation introduced into their religion by Pachacutec as part of his process of religious reform, which thus tended to modify the role of their tribal deity, Inti, the sun god, thereby reduced to the role of a mere son of the Supreme Creator. Other scholars, on the contrary, tend to stress the supremacy of Inti and to portray Viracocha as 
little more than a Otios high god. However, as Arthur Demarest has insisted in his study of the Andean high god, the most splendid ceremonies seem to honor the sun rather than Viracocha, and the priest of Inki, the sun, presides at all important rituals. The Inca himself confessed his sins not to Viracocha, but directly to the sun, and the sun god is generally described as the father of the Incas. Moreover, it is Inti who inspired the cult of the Inca ruler as the conqueror and titular owner of vast realms, in whose main centers the Inca invariably built a temple to honor the worship of the sun. In all accounts, an important place in the Inca pantheon is also assigned to the Inca thunder or weather god, Ilapa. Ilapa, in his role as rain giver, was greatly revered and many temples were dedicated to his worship. His image was displayed beside that of Inti in the great square in Cusco and his effigy was carried in processions in a golden crusted litter. According to almost every chronicler, the creator, sun, and weather gods shared the main altar in the Temple of the Sun in the Coricancha Temple Complex. They are pictured together on the altar in the drawings of Huaman Poma. Moreover, their images invariably figured in the major religious ceremonies. The Inca hierarchical establishment was, at least in theory, massively endowed as the owner of part of the lands in each conquered province. At the head of this establishment stood the high priest of Coricancha, the very center of the imperial cult where Pachacutec placed effigies of past rulers seated on golden thrones. Their mummified remains were jealously guarded by their panacas. As part of his religious reform, Pachacutec had also introduced the cult of the young son, Bunchao, to whom he dedicated another magnificent statue of solid gold housed in its own temple. Central to the functioning of the great temple complex were the virgins of the sun called Ak Aklakona and Kachua, simply meaning chosen women. The name was apt since the process of selection was rigorous. During a notivate of three years, practical tasks were learned such as cooking and spinning. When they reached the age of about fifteen, the high priest, accompanied by the Inca in person, went to the temple and commanded them to choose between marriage to a noble and dedication to the service of the sun. Each principal Inca center throughout the provinces had its own Aklaokona convent, subject to the authority of a woman revered as the Bride of the Sun God. The largest of these establishments, that of the Great Temple Complex in Cusco, consisted of more than 1,500 women. Among their many tasks was the preparation of ceremonial food and of the drink chicha, consumed in vast quantities during feasts. The exquisite garments woven by these women were designed for the ruler and his family, as well as for leading priests. Some were used in sacrificial ceremonies. Rigorous chastity was imposed on the virgins of the sun. If thus rule was infringed, they were buried alive. Inca Rituals The virgins played a leading role in Inca ceremonial, of which vivid accounts survive, some deriving from Spanish eyewitnesses. Pachacutec was reportedly the author of Inca ceremonialism in its most spectacular form. Under his guidance, the calendar of monthly ceremonies was, re was redesigned in such a way as to, as to dramatize the spiritual life of the people and to reinforce the imperial cult. Basic to this purpose was the initial ceremony which took place in December and was known as Capac Rami, the Great Festival, which involved rigorous tests of endurance as a preliminary to the initiation of the young nobles. After grueling nights of exposure on the icy slopes of a nearby peak, the boys came down to Cusco. Having performed a special dance, they were whipped on their arms and legs by their more seasoned kinsmen. Only on the fourteenth day did they again climb the, sl the slopes of another mountain. This ascent was followed by a headlong downhill race that sometimes caused maiming and even death. The same process was then repeated twice over. The bizarre ritual of the ascent and descent of the four mountains perhaps symbolized the fourfold division of Tawantin Suyu. On the 21st day, the boys were richly attired and then their earlobes were split in preparation for the insertion of the earplugs, the ceremony which would formally confer on them the appellation of Orejon. The most sumptuous feast was the Inti Raimi, to, to celebrate the harvesting of the maize crop in June. The Spaniards, as part of the policy of placating their, their puppet emperor, Manco, before he finally revo revolted, allowed the Inca to perform some of their great rituals, of a kind that had been immediately suppressed in post-conquest Mexico. Hence, we have a European eyewitness description of Inti Raimi from Cristobal de Molina, a Spanish priest. After the initial sacrifices by the Inca himself, the effigies or mummies of the former rulers were brought out and placed under finely worked feather awnings. They were accompanied by richly robed orejones wearing silver cloaks and tunics. As the sun rose, they began to chat in splendid harmony and unison. The Inca, seated on a rich stool beneath a canopy, was the first to open the, ch the chant. 
In the words of Cristobal de Molina, Throughout this time, great offerings were being made. On a platform on which there was a tree, there were Indians doing nothing but throwing meats into a great fire and burning them up in it. At, an, at another place, the Inca ordered yus, or llamas, to be thrown for the poor common Indians to grab, and this caused great sport. At eight o'clock, over two hundred girls came out of Cusco, each with a large new pot of one and a half arrobas, twenty-seven li liters of chicha, plastered and with a cover. The girls came in groups of five, full of precision and order, and passing at intervals. They also offered the sun many bales of a herb that the Indians chill and call coca, whose leaf is like myrtle. There were many other ceremonies and sacrifices. It is sufficient to say that when the sun was about to set in the evening, the Indians showed great sadness at its departure. In their chants and expressions, they allowed their, vo their voices to die away on purpose. And as the sun was sinking completely and disappearing from the sight, they made a great act of reverence, raising their hands and worshipping it in the deepest humility. All the apparatus of the festival was immediately dismantled and the canopies were removed. Everyone returned to their homes and the effigies and the fearsome relics were returned to their houses and tribes. These effigies that they had under the awnings were those of the former Incas who had ruled Cusco. Each had a great retinue of men who stayed there all day fanning away flies with fans like hand mirrors made of swan's feathers. Each also had its own mamaconas who were like, who were, who were like nuns. There were some twelve to fifteen in each awning. They came out in the same way for eight or nine days in succession. When all the festivals were over, they brought out the last day. They brought out on the last day many hand plows. These had formerly been made of gold. After the religious service, the Inca took a plow and began to break the earth, and the rest of the lords did the same. Following their lead, the entire kingdom did likewise. No Indian would have dared to break the earth until the Inca had done so, and none believed that the earth could produce unless the Inca broke it first. This ritual breaking of the earth by the Inca was the means of asserting his personal authority throughout his domains. Sacrifice was basic to Inca ceremonial. The most usual offerings were those of llamas and guinea pigs offered in profusion to many huacas. Brown llamas were sacrificed to viracocha, white llamas and alpacas to the sun. The priest left the animal around, led the animal around the image, then turned its head towards the god and slit its, and slit its throat. Food and chicha were also regularly presented as sacrificial offerings to the huacas and to the mummies of former rulers. Human sacrifice, often treated more as a monopoly of the ancient Mexicans, was not infrequent. In certain instances, when a new province was conquered, a few of the most handsome inhabitants were, were brought to Cusco and offered to the sun in thanks for victory. While sacrifice was hardly practiced on a mass scale, men, women, and above all children, were offered whenever a special appeal to the mercy of the gods was called for. This might occur at the beginning of a new reign. If the ruler was gravely ill, if an earthquake occurred, or some other natural calamity faced the empire. In outlying provinces, human sacrifice was also practiced. Children were required for the Inca temples. They had to be physically perfect, without marks or blemishes. They were feasted before sacrifice, that they might not die hungry or unhappy. Older children were usually first m made drunk. Some of them were buried alive, but most were forced to walk three times around the image of the god, after which their throats were cut or their hearts torn out. While still beating, the hearts were offered to the god. The bodies were buried in special cemeteries near important shrines such as Pachacamac, where the contents of such burial grounds have been st studied by archaeologists. Sacrifice, mainly of children and white llamas, was also used for the purpose of divination, a very key element in Inca religious practice. The Incas believed in the need to consult the forces of the supernatural before taking any important action, particularly with regard to military operations. For such purposes, certain important shrines were used, including Pachacamac and also Apurimac, situated on the banks of the Rio Apurimac near Cusco. Divination of a more everyday nature was accompanied by observing the movements of snakes and spiders. According to Bernard Cobo, in central and northern Peru, when a diviner was consulted, he would open a large jar containing a live spider. If any of its, of its legs were bent, it was a bad augury. Evil omens tended to outnumber good ones. Eclipses and falling stars foretold disasters such as the death of an emperor. When a comet appeared during the imprisonment of Atahualpa at Cajamarca, he concluded, not incorrectly, that his end was near. Even such natural phenomena as the hooting of an owl or the howling of a dog were held to foretell the death of a relative. To encounter snakes, lizards, spiders, toads, and even big worms was an evil omen. If a snake was found in a house, the owner killed it, urinated upon it, and then crushed it with its left foot 
to ward off evil. Notions of the afterlife, usually so basic to religious practice, were somewhat vague. Virtuous persons went to live with the, with the sun in the upper world, while the sinners went to the interior of the earth, where they had no food but stones. The nobles, however, were spared such privations and supposedly went to heaven, regardless of their virtues. The Sapanika The ruler, officially known as the Sapanika, was supreme in both spiritual and temporal affairs. But notwithstanding his sublime s status, the procedure by which he attained it is rather ill. It is rather ill def defined. Most chroniclers imbued with European notions of primogenitor erroneously assume that the ruler's eldest son became his rightful heir. The Polish scholar Marius Zielkowski deduces from the available da data that in earlier times the high priest, as the mouthpiece of the son, was directly responsible for the choice of a new sovereign whose election took place in Coricancha. To the question as to who in turn chose the high priest, no clear answer exists. But according to the same author, following Pachacutex's religious ref reformation, roles were reversed. The high priest was henceforth nominated by the sovereign, while the choice of ruler was simply made by the lords of Cusco, who chose the most apt of the late monarch's kin. As the empire expanded, each succession was marked by a struggle for power. The number of, special, of potential candidates to the throne was, in theory, limited to the children of a single uh, royal spouse, known as the Koya, queen. Often, in later times, a sister of the new ruler, whom he married on the day that he received the royal tassel. However, some Koyas produced no heirs, while others had several sons who then became rival, rival claimants, leading to a fierce struggle for power whenever his, the throne became vacant. A further procedure was introduced as a means to eliminate strife, the adoption of one heir as a co-ruler during a king's lifetime. But this practice also tended to fail since rulers were apt to change their minds and substitute a second co-ruler for their original choice, thus fomenting the likelihood of bitter conflict between the successive co-rulers on their father's death. Bachakutek, for instance, chose Amaru Yubanki, but later adopted Tupac Yubanki in his place. Tupac, the favorite candidate of the military rather than the religious hi hierarchy, was then confronted with a palace re revolt fomented by yet another brother after his succession. Dupac himself never designated an official co-ruler, but altered his original choice as successor, naming one already on his deathbed, Tito Kusi, son of his sister wife, Mama Oklo. Only after the bitter internal feud did Tito Kusi prevail and succeed to the throne, assuming the name of Juan Nakapak. Hence, it becomes clear that disputes over the succession were not confined to the ultimate and most disastrous instance, the civil war between Atahuapa and Huascar. The, the latter was to some extent the preferred choice of the religious hierarchy of Lower Cusco, while Atahuapa was a favorite of the northern armies. In spite of such initial impediments, the Inca monarch, once duly enthroned, was an absolute ruler, whose authority was unquestioned. An aura of divinity enhanced his role as the offspring of the sun. This association with Inti, the solar deity, was part of the cult that united not only the empire, but the whole universe, since Tawantin Tsuyu was conceived as corresponding with the universe itself. The Inca's formal insignia of authority, the equivalent of a European crown, consisted of a many-colored braid band with wound several, t several times around the head, from which hung a red fringe with tassels fixed to little golden tubes. The emperor, as part of his insignia, on important occasions carried a mace with a, gold, with a golden star head. He traveled in a litter with an immense following and his dignity required him to proceed as slowly as possible, not more than about 12 miles a day. Anyone who sought audience, no matter what his, his rank, had to remove his sandals and place a token burden upon his back. The ruler usually sat behind a screen and only in exceptional instances received visitors face to face. The semi-divine status of the later rulers was enhanced by the presence of a protective band of women, including secondary wives, who produced a large number of, of offspring, many of whom played a leading role in civil and above all military affairs. By Atahualpa's time, according to his sister Inez Yubanqui, the ruler's wives were held in such high esteem that no one dared to look them in the face. However, a wife who committed any impropriety would immediately be killed. John Hemming, in his account of the, Sp of the Spanish conquest, describes the Spanish fascination with the elaborate rituals that formed part of the Inca mon monarch's fastidious existence, even in captivity. To quote Pedro Pizarro, 
When at the WAPA 8, he was seated on a wooden stool little more than a span 20 centimeters high. This stool was very lovely reddish wood and was always kept covered with a delicate rug, even when he was seated upon it. The ladies brought his meal and placed it before him on tender green, on tender thin green rushes. They placed all the vessels of gold, silver, and pottery on these rushes. He pointed to whatever fancied, and it was bought. One of the one of the ladies took it and held it in her hand while he ate. He was eating one day in this way when I was present. A slice of food was being lifted to his mouth when a drop fell on the clothing he was wearing. Giving his hand to the Indian lady, he rose and went to his chamber to change his dress and returned wearing a dark brown tunic and cloak. I approached him and felt the cloak, which was softer than silk. I said to him, Inca, of what is a robe as soft as this made? He explained that it was from the skin of vampire bats that fly by night in Puerto Viejo and Tumbes and that bite the natives. On another occasion, Pedro Pizarro was taken to see the royal storehouses full of leather chests. Some of these contained all his discarded clothing. Others held the rushes that they placed before his feet when he ate, as well as the bones of animals or birds that he had eaten. All these items had to be burned since everything that had been touched by the rulers as sons of the sun had to be reduced to ashes and thrown to the air, for no one else was allowed to touch it. Adulation of the emperor went to sublime lengths. Another witness, Juan Ruiz de Arce, recalls that he did not expectorate onto the ground. A woman held out her hand and he spat into it. The woman removed any hairs that fell on his clothing and ate them. This was because he was frightened of so or sorcery and feared he might be bewitched by the hairs if they were not eaten. So profound was the respect accorded to the ruler that even when he was a Spanish prisoner, chiefs from many provinces would present themselves before him, kissing his hands and feet. He behaved towards them in a most princely manner, showing no less majesty when in prison and defeated than he had before that occurred. Since the monarch enjoyed a semi-divine status, his death was the, elaborate, was the occasion of elaborate rites in which the whole empire took part. His favorite women were expected to accompany him to the next world. They were made drunk before being strangled. His elaborately wrapped body was deposited in his palace under the care of his descendants. By virtue of this concept of the spiritual deathlessness of an Inca ruler, he passed on to his successor only the exercise of his office, not his riches. This wealth, at least in the time of Pachacutec, if not bef before, was, as we have seen, immediately locked away within the institution known as his Panaca, which included his blood relatives and retainers. The Panaca began to function as soon as a ruler died. His mummy bundle, splendidly housed, was meticulously attended throughout the day. His concubines even served him his favorite foods as if he were still alive. His coca plantations continued to, f to function, bailing the finest leaves for the former ruler's use, while the shepherds continued to furnish their tallies of n newborn llamas in his herds. The royal mummy even had voices speaking through the oracular lips of his representatives, through whom he could converse with the living, at times toasting other deceased rulers, and at other times issuing invitations bidding them to visit him in his palace. The Panaka system created many internal problems, both political and economic. The huge land holdings of the Panacas, consisting of much of the best land in the valley of Cusco, were a fund of wealth that was frozen in time, inalienable, and stagnant. A new ruler, for whom the, this wealth was inviolate, had to create his own patrimony, to provide for his needs, and to endow his own future Panaca. The means by which a living ruler could accumulate such riches is far from clear. Inca lands throughout the provinces were more state than personal property, and it was surely hard for the ruler to obtain private lands nearer home, since much of the best land around Cusco, apart from the Panaca property, belonged to the royal Ailus. The Cusco Ailu system comprised not only these 11 royal Ailus, but also others, probably 12 in number, that embraced the Incas by privilege, living beyond the bounds of central Cusco. The Ailu, a kinship group that still exists in present-day Peru, is somewhat hard to define in the chronicler's accounts, do little to clarify its role. John Rowe, rejecting the description of the Ailu as a clan, defines it as a kin group with descent in the male line, whose main function was the ownership of a defined territory. The Señores of Cusco The chroniclers often referred to the choice of a new ruler as being made by the Señores of Cusco by, impl by implication of Orejones. Their status was in every respect unique, since only these nobles, together with the Llanos who served them, could live in the central part of the city. They alone wore sumptuous clothing. The sons of Orejones were educated in a special school. 
The antecedents of this ruling class are not wholly clear. Since the emperor possessed a plethora of secondary wives, in addition to the principal spouse, the Koya, each ruler could engender a large number of offspring, but while the Orejones were all theor theoretically of royal blood. In the course of a few centuries, the rulers alone could scarcely have produced enough children to form more than the nucleus of a force able to conquer a huge empire. Hence the importance of the role of the Incas by privilege, not of royal blood, but who may have been very numerous, far outstanding for the far outnumbering rather the original Ordejones. The role of the Ordejones as army commanders is clearly paramount. Close relatives, whether uncles, brothers, or sons of rulers, are often named as leading generals and also as provincial governors. However, while distinctions between the exercise of military leadership and civil administration are often blurred, Ordejones surely presided over the imperial infrastructure as a whole, including such matters as irrigation, town planning, and road construction. The evidence suggests that the key posts of government were held by Ordejones, though doubtless Inca by privilege also played a major role in the administration. But when the sources often write of the Lords of Cusco or the highest in the land as deciding key, key issues, particularly the succession to the throne, they presumably refer to the Ordejones. Reports of how the Inca state function are hardly ex explicit. While certain sources write of a council of twelve who advised the ruler, references are more frequent to the presence of four counselors, one from each of the four suyus, on whose advice the emperor depended for major de decisions. They apparently had power to resolve all but the most difficult questions without even consulting the Inca, and played a leading role in deciding when to wage war. But quite apart from any such inner council, whether formed of twelve or four principal ordejones to control the Inca realm which extended over such vast distances, some former centralized administrative staff was clearly needed. Modern authors often refer to this as the Inca bureau bureaucracy, though the term derived from the word for a, for a writing desk hardly retains the same meaning in a context where writing, and therefore paperwork, was absent. It must always be borne in mind that, particularly in the reign of Juan Capac, the Inca himself was continually waging war in remote parts of Ecuador and even Chile, and, ma and many pressing decisions had to be made in Cusco that could not be referred to to the ruler, notwithstanding the fine communications network. A rebellion, or perhaps an ecological disaster in, say, Colau, would require immediate action, including perhaps the mobilization and dispatch of armies. This was complicated by a special factor. Unlike certain ancient empires in which the army was recruited more from the metropolitan region, the Incas deployed numerous l l levies drawn from peoples located throughout the length and breadth of their far-flung realm. The deployment of over vast distances of such forces, and their arrival at the right time, at the right place, must have involved military staff work of a complex nature. The infrastructure of the imperial road system must, have also, must also have involved a constant process of decision making at the center, as well as, personal, as, well as personnel rather, capable of making detailed plans. While no records of charts or maps have survived, the question arises as to how far decisions on an imperial scale could be made without some records of this kind, since it seems almost beyond the capacity of the human brain to memorize the whole road system and all its details, including every bridge. A key instrument of provincial rule was the decimal system, which would surely be unma unmanageable without the aid of the kipu knots, used to record numbers, but hardly events. Little detailed evidence survives of how the system functioned, though Siesta de Leon affirms that officials known as kipu Camayos resided in each province and used the, the, the quipus to keep a tally of the available manpower and material resources. Siesta cites as an example of the methods whereby the quipu camayos of the province of Chaucha dis displayed their talents. For instance, from their records in the form of quipu knots, they were able to itemize the exact quantities of gold, silver, textiles, food, and animals ex extracted by the Spanish from that province. Similar, similar skills obviously served to keep records of the garrisons, stores, and all other aspects of imperial administ administration, whether civil or military, and such records, not confined to purely local use, presumably, presumably rather, required a central staff to coordinate data from each province, a process on which the decisions of the ruler or of others, in the case of his frequent absence, had to be based. Of such aspects of Inca administration, of scarce interest to, sp to, sp to Spanish chroniclers, few, if any, details survive. Everyday life in Cusco. Up to this point, our account of Cusco has been centered upon the privileged classes whose control over both the military and civil organization was absolute. Most of the chronicler's information refers much more to such people than to the lives of the average citizen.
Bernabe Cobo stresses that this elite was far from being restricted to the Incas by blood. After these, the Orejones, the governors, captains, caciques, and judges of the Inca, along with their children, enjoyed the immunities and exemptions of nobles. Not only were they all exempt from the taxes paid by the common people, but they received salaries from their king and were supported with the tribute of personal service that the taxpayers rendered to them. Notwithstanding the sharp distinction that Kobo makes between the rich and the common people, he at least implies the existence of many different categories among the latter. In particular, he mentions the craftsmen, who as a reward for their skills were, in a sense, also, pr also privileged, since they surely received more than the average person, who simply paid tribute in the form of labor. In place of paying tribute, the craftsmen worked in the service of the Inca, of the church, or of their own caciques. Each one performed the craft that he knew, such as making garments, working gold or silver, extracting these metals from the mines and processing them, making clay and wooden cups, as well as practicing other crafts. The chronicler, however, goes on to say that these craftsmen were provided with tools and instruments, and did not invest anything of their own except manual labor. The, the, the ghettos, or wooden cups mentioned above, are among the most characteristic forms of Inca art, which in some respects tend to be regarded as rather pedestrian as compared with that of earlier per Peruvian cultures. Some types of ghetto were carved in the shape of a puma's or jaguar's head, and others in the form of a man's head. Most are inlaid with lacquer, with geometric designs, arranged in zones, cut into their surface. These Inca-style wooden cups continued to be made in the colonial period, depicting not only Indians in a Spanishized dress, but also Spaniards. As John Rowe observes, the designs on these cups are superb in their illumination of battle scenes, hunting and expeditions to the eastern forests, dances and festivals, plants and animals, illustrate nearly every aspect of life of the life of that period. Rowe even compares them to the best work of the Mexican codices. While the aesthetic appeal of their pottery is indeed hardly comparable to that of certain earlier cultures, later Inca ware, if unimaginative, is distinctive. Inca pottery is fine grain, very hard and finished with a polished surface. The decoration is characterized by a constant repetition of geometric patterns, diamonds, checkers, and cross-hatching. Life forms are seldom used, while colors are rather somber with red, black, and white prevailing. Such pottery, as we have seen, was widely diffused throughout the empire offering to the archaeologists concrete evidence as to its ex extent. In contrast to the splendor of Inca palaces and temples, the dwellings of the common people were so simple as to lead Bernabe Cobo to, aff to affirm that they should really be called huts or cabins rather than houses. The walls were of beaten earth, or on the coast, of adobe bricks. They had no windows and no chimney, the smoke from the fire escaping through the thatched roof. The simple entrance was low and small. These simple one-story constructions contained a single room in which a whole family lived, cooked, and slept, with the, f with the floor serving both as table and bed. Llama skins, thrown on the ground and folded double, took the place of beds, one half serving as mattress and the other half as a covering. In these modest habitations, the family seldom gathered until after nightfall. Either they were scattered due to their various occupations, or else remained crouched on the th threshold. Their austere mode of life was closely monitored by the authorities. The houses were inspected by officials twice a year, and the hanging over doorway had to be opened at meal times in order that inspectors could verify that all the rules were being observed. The garments worn by the common people were almost as simple as their dwellings. On the chilly altiplano, clothing was a necessity, while on the coast it was needed only to cover certain sensitive parts of the body. The typical Inca man's dress cons consisted of a breech cloth and a sleeveless tunic with a large cloak for cold weather and for more formal occasions. The sleeveless tunic consisted of a long piece of cloth with a slit in the middle for the head. It reached nearly to the knees. At higher altitudes, such garments were made of llama wool. Once this everyday robe was put on, it, it lasted until it was worn out. Women would wear a long belted tunic open at the sides and, freezing, and freeing the legs for ease in walking. They also wore gray cloaks fastened across the breast by a large headed pin. Both sexes usually went barefoot, but sometimes wore sandals with soles made of llama leather. Such sandals had a brightly colored woolen fastening. While the sources tend to ascribe to the living conditions of the working masses a certain uniformity, the number of a man's wives rather than the nature of his dwelling was perhaps a better index of his wealth and prestige, though the majority of the common people were probably too poor to possess more than one wife, since, pol since polygamy ranked as a sign of wealth. In all cases, the first wife took precedence over subsequent spouses. Many of the latter were war captives with whom the Inca regaled his more deserving subjects. 
Such secondary wives could not take the place of the first wife if she died. If their husband died, the secondary wives could be inherited by a son. The ordinary Inca families lived in groups for which, they, for which still today the term Ailu is used. In modern Indian so society, the Ailu consists of a number of unrelated extended families living together in a restricted area and following certain rules of crop rotation. There is n no doubt that comparable systems existed in ancient times, but their exact nature is hard to define. It is important to bear in mind that in outer Cusco, beyond the traditional and closely clustered center, conditions were not so strictly urban and cultivation of the available land played an important role in people's lives. John Rowe insists, as we have seen, that the Ailu in Inca times was not a clan in the, st in the strictest sense, but a kind of kin group with, at least in theory, descent from a common male ancestor. In control of a definite territory of which each family cultivated a part. In Inca times, these family lots were redistributed every year in conformity with changing needs. Bernard Cobo, in writing of Inca marriage, depre deprecates the lack of interest in the chastity of the bride. We should pass over rapidly such a foul smelling quagmire, the sewer of turpitude and indecency in which these idolaters wallowed. Because they never knew the, spl the splendor and beauty of chastity, they never appreciated it. They said that those who were virgins had never been loved by anyone. As a, ma as a matter of fact, few remained virgins until they were married. In accord with such dep depraved customs, when an Indian chooses a woman to be his wife, he does not try to, fi to find out if she has led a virtuous life. The foremost conclusion was the wealth that she possessed. Second to this was her capacity for hard work. Since the second question could only be determined by trial and error, a man would usually first take a woman as a, as a concubine and keep her on a trial basis for months or even at times for years. While this attitude toward sexual behavior might seem dis distinctly lax, in other respects the children were subject to precise rules and strict discipline. When a child reached a certain age, which varied in different regions between 5 and 12 years, he was integrated into the group with the ritual cutting of hair and nails. An even more formal ceremony took place at between age 12 and 14 years, when the child was incorporated into the Ailu and into the nation. The elders whipped the legs of a young man and reminded him of his duty towards his parents and his, and his superiors. Ex except perhaps on the numerous feast days, the, the diet of the unprivileged was rather austere. Two meals were served a, a day in the early morning and at sunset. The dishes were placed on the floor where the man and his wife sat back to back, eating from separate plates, into which guinea pigs and dogs would thrust their noses at will. The most basic food, known as chuno, was made from, pot was made from potatoes, simply ground and mixed with water, salt, and pepper to form a kind of gruel. As an alternative, maize was roasted, boiled, or ground into flour. The popular diet seems to have been somewhat lacking in protein. Llamas were not generally eaten. But used, to, but used exclusively to provide wool and as a means of transport. Guinea pigs were domesticated, but were only edible for 12 hours after being killed. Birds, frogs, and even worms were used to, to flavor soups. From the rather scanty information available, one gains the impression that the diet of the ordinary people, as opposed to the upper classes, was somewhat low not only in protein but calories, particularly in view of the heavy work that they were expected to perform. It has, however, to be borne in mind that much of our information on, much, on such matters derives from Kobo, who wrote over a, a century after, after the conquest and based his information mainly on his own observ observation of how the common people lived in his day rather than in pre-conquest times. The er early chroniclers, such as Ciesa de Leon and Juan de Betanzos, offer little information on such matters as diet, though Ciesa, in recording his long journey through Ecuador and Peru, often, des often describes the fertility of the land. Moreover, the Inca centers built along the principal roads, massive quantities of foodstuffs were stored. Accounts also survive of the great efforts made by the Incas to improve irrigation and thereby increase food production throughout their empire. This concludes chapter 7.